going to move on to our next session now. Um, she's going to be led by Kerry Nutley. And Kerry is VP for Front Office Transformation and has 20 years experience plus in leading global sales teams for companies such as Deloitte and BT. Uh, Kerry is also our head judge for the Besmer Awards this year. Ah. So uh, you got to be, if you are thinking of entering or putting names forward, you've got to be particularly nice to Kerry over the next session. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Kerry's going to uh, lead this session up until about 12. We might run over a little bit into lunch if that's okay, five, ten minutes, because we are running a little bit late. Uh, and Kerry's going to be talking to us about optimising CRM effectiveness through sales leadership. So over to you, Kerry. Excellent. Thanks very much, David. And thank you very much for taking time out, which I'm sure everyone is super busy at the moment to uh, come and hear about this. The reason why I picked this um, topic, and I now feel maybe I shouldn't have called it CRM, I should have called it Customer Success Platform, uh, is um, when I went to Dreamforce uh, last year representing BT Global Services, when I spoke to my fellow colleagues of other large companies like Shage, Virgin, uh, etc., one of the common questions we all had as being accountable for seeing the return on the investment of the platform was how do I get people to use it more? And I, and I don't know if that's a question that you guys have, um, but what I want to do today is to share with you some of my experience and knowledge as an HR director for BT, running and doing their leadership uh, capabilities, as well as my experience from sales, to maybe give you quite a different controversial uh, view of why people don't necessarily want to platforms like sales CRM tools and have a think about how that might be showing up in your organization to maybe to go away and have a think about what you could do differently. Okay, so let's start us off. So the first statement that I want to make is that to optimize a sales CRM tool, you really need quality of data. That's not a new principle, that's the same for any system. Good data in uh, ensures that good quality output of that information from the system. And given the presentation that um, Vicky's just given, as you can see, the majority of sales CRM systems are presenting uh, information on forecasts, on pipelines, and opportunity. So if people, therefore, as in your sales teams, don't put in quality data to start off with or accurate data, then obviously the data that you get out in those reports aren't going to be as much value as you want. Now, often when we look at looking at CRM systems, we think about what I call about the hard elements of a sales ecosystem. We're thinking about, as Vicky said, optimizing the administrative part of that platform, creating collaboration, ensuring that it reflects things like our customer segments, our landscapes, our account plans, and all the good things that we'd want to put to automate those quite administrative tasks that we find our sales managers doing. What we don't necessarily do when we look at our sales CRM systems is do and have a think about the softer side. Now, I don't mean about linking sales force and opportunities into our pay plan, but I'm thinking about how we lead on it, how we coach on it, how we ask our team to respond to that data. So I'm going to ask you now to raise your hand if you have a sales CRM system in the organisation you work for. I'm going to ask you to keep your hand up if you received training on that CRM system tool, either ongoing or as part of the deployment. I'm going to ask you to keep your hand up if that training for line managers includes how you coach on it. In one-to-ones? OK. So I've probably got three people, maybe four, out of the entire room that initially put their hand up. And I'm going to say to you is kind of my controversial statement, and it's not really that controversial because actually it's the way that we work, that as line managers, as people that interact with the people that we need to put the data in an accurate and timely manner onto the system, we can influence that. We can influence their emotional state, whether they look at that CRM system as something that is rewarding and they want to use, or it actually creates a threat. And in that threat state, we will proactively, as human beings, move away from using it. And it's this that I want us to focus on in the next hour, to think about, as managers within our organization, how this might be showing up. How we work with the system as people to optimize that administration, that insight, that collaboration, those extra growth 
which is what we put in the business case when we bought it from Salesforce, from Oracle, from Microsoft, whoever that is, to see how we can get more out of the system by getting people to move towards it. The other thing that I'm going to put out there is that actually the CRM system in itself creates a threat state <laughs> just by being the CRM system. <laughs> and the reason for this is if you have the spreadsheets, if you have the one-to-one -one conversations with your line manager, that's a one-to-one -one relationship. What the CRM system will do from a salesperson perspective is it grows that visibility. How many of the reports or, or KPIs go from your CEO that can drill down on that system to the individual? How many of those reports that you have in your system not only shows my performance as a salesperson, but also shares that with the performance of the other people? And this is kind of what might generate what we call a threat state. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you in a minute a video by a guy called David Rock. David Rock was one of the many consultants that we utilised in BT when we rolled out our £6 million um, leadership programme to help managers move from a, from a directional coaching style to a kind of coaching collaborative style to think about the human psychology and the neuroscience. Now, what a threat state does is it moves people away from those activities versus a reward state, which is common knowledge, will move people to. This isn't you. It's not kind of, you know, David Rock's come up with this piece of information. You have prospecting theory. Corporate visions use this in terms of thinking about how customers buy. And there are many th similar theories out there in the marketplace around neuroscience and how we as all human individuals and human beings react. And it's not new, and it's because it's the way that as we were cavemen, we had to understand what our threat status was, because actually when the saber-toothed tiger <laughs> was coming to eat us, it was really important that we kind of either fought, we, um, we ran, or sometimes in the worst case scenarios, we might freeze. And so now we don't have the Sega tooth tiger with us, we have other threat states, things that cause us to kind of withdraw, get angry, get defensive. And that's very much kind of the interactions that we have in the office. Now, it's no longer the Sega tooth tiger. It can be people, you know, not giving us the appropriate status. It can be um, misconstrued feedback. It can be a, a sense of being unfair. That will put us all in a threat state where obviously the reverse of that will obviously move us to a reward state. And nine times out of ten in large organisations, because the interactive people that we want to get praise from, that we want to get recognition from, is the line manager or those people we see as kind of having status in the organisation, it's really important that when we sit down with our teams and we talk about things like how they're doing on the systems, how they're doing with the pipeline, we're doing it in a way that's open, that creates the reward states. If we don't do that and we don't think about that, we can inadvertently, where we have a poor culture with an unclear purpose, put people in a threat state. And then what you see is that people don't particularly want to give an accurate forecast, give that timely information, work in a collaborative uh, a way because they're worried about the consequences and what that means for them. So partly you could say maybe sandbagging is part of that. I'll keep that close to me. I don't want people to see um, you know, what's happening in my pipeline because I feel there might be some unfairness of me getting enhanced target. Partly is that I'm going to keep that to myself because I don't want to share you know, the recognition of that deal uh, as far as I can, as long as I can, because then people won't come and try and share that opportunity with me and I want to make sure that I maximise the pay and return on that deal myself. So these are some of the things that you might see when people feel that they're in a threat state. So what I'm going to use, and there was many methods out there that I can choose, I'm just going to use this guy called David Rock. David Rock's um, based in the States. He's the director of Neuro Leadership Institute. You can find this content on the internet. And he is the author of many titles that look at how your brain works and look at leaderships within organisation around the very simple elements of neuroscience. 
as I say, we rolled this out when we were in BT. Uh, it was part of our wider coaching course. And what I'm just doing here today is to have a look at that in the context of CRM systems and how we as people engage with the system, engage with our managers and say, how might this be turning up? And then after we've thought about it for our own organisations, I'll just share with you five buckets of top tips that you might want to take away and have a think about for your own company. Sound like a plan? Okay. Yeah. I'm now going to move into um, the video from YouTube, so just bear with me. with it something similar no. all new okay so um, basically um, what happens in the brain in the neuroscience is that you're actually working out about five times every minute whether you're in a threat uh, situation or, or a reward situation and what neuroscientists are finding through the kind of art of mindfulness is that the majority of the thoughts that we have probably about 90% of them 
or more about am I in a threat situation? And that's just because of human evolution. You need to check that first. So you're definitely going to run from the saber-toothed tiger. You may or may not go and collect the bananas or go and um, dig the potato or whatever, because you can choose to do this one. But this one, you have to move away from now. Likewise, when we think about um, threat statuses, um, they're not equal. So if I had a pound of reward status and I had a pound of threat status, this would have a five times bigger impact on me than actually a reward. So if you think about last time somebody gave you a piece of recognition, you might have to think about it for a few seconds, but if I asked you when was this the last time you got negative feedback, you could probably think about that. You would probably have a higher emotion. You could probably give me a really good explanation about why that happened. And that's just the way that we all work. Um, well, the majority of us, because everyone's different and we're not all black and white, but the majority of us work in this way. The issue with having a threat state and people working in a threat state is that it closes people down. So you close down their cognition, you close down their perception, they become very isolated. And sometimes when you see people under considerable stress or not happy or feeling threatened, you can actually see that in their body language as well as what they say. And I'm probably sure that although we don't want to, we've probably seen colleagues that have been going through both personal and work stress that, that they've been in that state. So I appreciate that's uh, quite a lot to take in. Um, so what I'm going to do for you now is I'm just going to give you a reminder of kind of the uh, negative uh, impact of threat state, just because we're there more than we should be. And obviously it's harder based on our neuroscience to get people into a reward state. So when we look at status, just as a reminder, because if you've not worked with it, it's just a good refresh from the video. Uh, when you're in a threat state around status, it's when you feel that other people are compared more favorably than you. Um, mm -hmm. You feel there's a lack of achievement. Um, maybe you've had some feedback, and that's lowered your status. Um, actually, sometimes it can just be body language. If you're sat in front of somebody, and they're on their phone, and they're not listening to you, right? I don't know about you, but I was writing this presentation, and, and one thing that puts me in a threat area around status is I have this innate hate for when you're speaking to somebody in a service environment at a hotel or a shop, and the phone rings and they pick it up. <laughs> Everyone else? Yeah. yeah. You're just like, I've stood it, right? And that just emotion, just thinking about it, it kind of bubbles something up inside of me. I, I can't help it, it just irritates me. And this is the type of emotional response that you get to being in a threat state regarding status. And actually, the default uh, response rate for that in this area of the brain is around becoming angry. And if it's about feedback, sometimes defensive as well. Certainty then, well, obviously, for threat state, it's about being uncertain. Um, now, this is actually something that's triggered in the brain. But it's actually... Um, our brain does not like knowing or being unsure. And I don't know if anybody else sometimes has the role of control freak, but as humans, we, we kind of strive for having control, having an understanding of the logic, knowing what's coming next. That's just the way that, that our brain works. Um, and uh, without that, we can sometimes feel threatened. If we don't know what's happening, actually what our brain will do is then start to try and work out answers. Do you guys do this? If I don't know what's happening, I'll try and work out scenarios. And then if I'm feeling a bit down or a bit threatened, the thing that's going to actually happen is the worst one. Happen? Feel mm. that before when we don't know what's actually going to happen? And that's just kind of the way the brain will work. That's kind of created when things keep moving. Anybody had a manager that constantly kept changing deadlines, constantly kept changing targets, that would put us in a threat state because we can't manage towards it. And um, autonomy, the best way to describe this in the workplace is, uh, is the word micromanagement. So to put people in the threat state around autonomy is to close down people through micromanagement, to not give them creativity and to not give them control. Relatedness is around um, how we buy in um, to a company, its purpose, its organisation, the big project that we're delivering. Do we believe it's going to deliver the benefits? Do we believe that there's something in us or is it all kind of management BS? Uh, and that can put us in a threat state. How many times, have, I mean, I used to work in service centres, and how many times would you go around and walk the floor 
and you hear someone going, yeah, I know, service, service is rubbish, service is rubbish. I know we've got that improvement program, but I don't see it hitting in either. And you're like, Jesus, you know, if you're saying that to our customers, you know, <laughs> what's that doing for our brand? But that's when you've got somebody who's kind of not feeling related to the program or the improvements. And that's just coming out as just a, a response. And you have to kind of think about how you've pitched it to them. Uh, the last one is fairness. It's quite uh, self-explanatory. Um, have you ever given feedback to somebody in end of a year of you and they think they've done an amazing job and, and basically they've not received the reward that you think and they're normally quite a you know, plateaued person but in that meeting they've just gone whoosh. That's what happens when you don't feel that something's been fair. It drives that kind of immediate burst of energy. Um, I know I've probably done it myself at some times but now I know why it's happening. So um, this is kind of the scarf model and just to give you that. And what I'd like us to do now is to create groups. I'm not going to tell you how to do that, but please make sure everyone's included. I don't want to put anybody in a threat state. Uh, <laughs> and what I've done is I've uh, left you a copy of, of these um, emotional responses. And what I'd like you to do is just to spend five, ten minutes in your groups just thinking about how these show up in your organisation. And given the topics around sales platforms and CRM tools, ideally think of that, but, you know, if you're... Don't be constrained by that. So... As an example, to kind of kick you off, um, you know, if I think about a CRM uh, platform and I can see my team's uh, ability to deliver against target, you know, it's Q3, I've looked on the, the KPI report and I'm further behind, right? Everyone else is kind of 80% mm. there about getting their gated t um, uh, target measure and I'm behind. So that could kind of challenge me and make me feel in a threat state from a status perspective. Likewise, for certainty, you know, if you kind of walk into an organisation and, and we know it's out there, um, that if you dismiss every time the lowest 10%, that can create a, a level of uh, uncertainty uh, and therefore put you in a, a threat status. So there's just some examples in your group, just work out um, how that might be showing up. It can be process, it can also be behaviour. So think about how you, your managers coach, how they look at one-to-ones as well. I'll let you get back on with that and come back together in about 10 to. That's okay. Um, so, does anybody want to share any of the conversations that you had in your groups in terms of, do we see this? Is it more often than not? How, how is it for you guys? Anyone you know, want to contribute? We, we talked a little bit about status, yeah. about things like President's Club, about things like leaderboards, some of those things that, you know, if you're at the top, that's fine, because you're feeling like you, you're part of this little mini competition, but if you're not down, you sort of disengage from it because you think, well, that's not for me, it's not something I'm going to take part in. And, and that's the thing, isn't it, with sales? You want to form some type of incentive, you want to recognise, in terms of fairness, people that are doing well, but how do you do that in an inclusive manner so it's not just the one, two percent that's always hitting the numbers? You're actually stretching that right down, so you're getting you know, at least down to the top 30%, 40% of your sales uh, community to really start encouraging them to go that extra mile. It's mm. a, a good example. Anybody else? It's about creating a spread of activity that you measure as well, though, isn't it? So if you can use your CRM system just on one thing, yeah. you know, naturally if that is the, the reason for your world, you can start, that, that creates the unfairness. It does. Well, you're measuring it on that. Yeah, I'm in a European business and I'm in, I'm in a country that's voted to leave the European Union, hypothetical example. Um, <laughs> and my world's ended, so don't judge me against this guy in Germany because his economy is flying or whatever. So exactly. you need to measure, I think, a variety of things to get a balanced picture of this whole balanced scorecard, which is the whole concept. Yeah. But that way gives everyone a chance to be in the game. Because you can't avoid the top and bottomness of sales. You can. But it doesn't have to be just one sector. Exactly. And it's a comparing apples with apples, oranges with oranges. Hey, these are standard things that we all know, right? So um, I hope you found that a good conversation. Mm -hmm. I hope it, you felt that some of the things that you see is not, you know, alien to you. And I definitely felt as I went through Dreamforce and looking about how we were optimising uh, Salesforce in BT, you know, we, we weren't alone with kind of getting and encouraging people to use the platform. And um, one thing that I would say uh, doing, having done change management uh, a lot, whether that was for Siebel or Oracle based systems in HR or Salesforce, when we talk about uh, management capability, it's not a one stop shop. You have to embed and sustain things by making it continual. 
And um, when we look into the reward state and I uh, go into kind of some top tips, that really is one of my top tips is how you collaborate, how you create communities and how you keep uh, the development and the, and the good practice around the organisation constantly going because it, you can't just train and walk away. I mean, when we speak to Andy Maurer, who's uh, the UK lead on Salesforce at Deloitte, they actually say that good practice is to spend 40% of your implementation budget on deployment over a stage period of 18 months to change a culture, to change a behaviour. And I definitely know that's true, having rolled out um, fibre networks as part of Superfast Broadband to you know, 33,000 engineers. It takes 18 months of a large organisation to move hearts, minds and feet. It just does, to just try and get people to own the change and do it off their own back. So you know, think about, are you really allocating enough of your budget to the embed and sustain? If you're just going to do the kind of whole design business case and implement, I would probably say you have a high percentage risk that you're not going to see the return on the benefits because people just won't take it up to deliver what you said you were going to do. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the reward state. Uh, so kind of the opposite, it's not <laughs> rocket science. Uh, so obviously uh, when we're in, uh, have feel we have high status, um, then uh, we have a feeling of purpose, we feel that we're quite smart. We might think that we know something more than somebody else and that makes us feel better. If someone coins us with a subject matter expert, maybe we've won a subject matter expert badge in Salesforce. It's a great tool. Uh, to help if you do it right and you communicate the purpose right that can really help give a reward of status certainty um, is around predictability um, we know what to expect when we turn up I, mean, I don't think anyone does days these days with the way that we work with the data and the technologies and the calls means we know what's going to happen in that day but we have a view of what's happening what's expected of us what our targets are they're fairly consistent how we can get them and what support is available to us that comes in a consistent way uh, and we can work to that to optimise our chances of being successful, you know, getting a great uh, OTB and above and therefore obviously seeing a return in our back pocket. Uh, autonomy is about allowing people to take responsibility for themselves. Sometimes when we're too insular with processes, you must go through this step and then this step. It, it doesn't work and, and sometimes it's not people just going, oh, I don't want to do this, but if you've ever been in sales like the majority of us has, Customers don't buy like that, right? Some of them say, I need this tomorrow. Some of them have got a massive procurement process. Some of them don't even know what they want. And more so when we do the face-to-face -face sales, you know, those volume-based sales, same price, same product, are going through the e-channels and therefore we're much more involved now in the complexity of a sale. Those solution-based kind of sales that we're now very much getting more involved with if it requires a person. Mm -hmm. So relatedness is how we relate, how we relate to our manager, how we relate to our peers, how we relate to the purpose and the statement of the organisation. Does that reflect to me? Now this one has become really, really important for millennials. The relatedness and the fairness of an organisation, their purpose is become really, really important. And I think we talked about Salesforce's purpose. And if you ever go to Dreamforce, you have the man with the ukulele. And that's very much very clear. It's very visual about their purpose and what they stand for. Uh, and that's becoming very much more so with the younger generations, maybe, than maybe some of uh, people our ages who kind of we were more about rewards and status. That, that really becoming as prevalent. Fairness, being treated with dignity and respect. Um, uh, recognition for what we do. Um, and I mentioned it earlier, but the allocation of resources in a fair way is really important. So there's nothing worse when you need like the deal architect and this guy's got a relationship with the other sales guy and they always work together, but you've got a bigger opportunity and you know maybe that they've not actually got such big commitment on the, on, on the proposition they're working for and you could really do with him. That doesn't feel fair. And when your line manager won't get involved to resolve it, that doesn't feel fair. So that can put you into a bit of a threat state. So, Ensuring that you don't have cliques, ensuring that you work in a, a community and ensuring that you have consistency and fairness both in terms of feedback and the way you work is really, really important to people. And I'm sure when you've thought back on your career, you know when you've worked well in this area and you know when it hasn't felt well and you can probably <coughs> recall those. All right. So um, what I wanted to do now, just before we wrap up for lunch, is just through my experience, I wanted to give you some top tips to think about how you manage this kind of neuroscience around CRM um, and uh, 
just to take away and to have a think about in terms of your organisation, do you do enough? Because it is some of this softer side and it's hard to do because everyone's looking about, can we deliver the efficiencies, have we got the pipeline to carve out the time? So I, I do know this, but the analysis from both uh, people like Forbes, Gartner, um, the ICF, the International Coaching Federation and Salesforce themselves and says that the return is probably considerably higher than maybe some of those operational ones if you can get it right. So let's just start with some of the top tips that I've done having implemented systems. Now, the first thing is acknowledge. Acknowledge the responsibility of the line manager and the, the state that they have in terms of giving people feedback and one-to-one -one information and using the system. So how I use it as a line manager impacts my team. So if I have a one-to-one -one and, and they know I would have gone through their sales force, I would have looked at the reports, their performance, their account plans, and I expect them to turn up and talk about it, I know that they would have spent some time re researching it and making sure they're aware of their data before they turned up. If I'm a bit sporadic, and sometimes I look, and sometimes I won't, and sometimes I just say to you, hey, how's it going for you? Because actually I'm busy over here, then I get to generate a different culture, and I'm not actually using the system or leaning on the system well enough to optimise my capability as a manager. So be aware of that. And also be aware of the language that we use is really important in terms of creating a threat state and a reward state. So open questions, putting autonomy back to people. So tell me about your Salesforce report. Tell me about your tight line. Tell me what's happening with your account. Whilst you both look at the data on the system, it's much better than saying that deal. Uh, it's not moved forward in five, five weeks. What's happening there? You can see the difference. The second thing is um, we've talked about the um, Ahana uh, purpose, having a really clear purpose driven from the top down. So you give people the certainty and being clear about that, how that CRM system tool is supporting that is really important. We talked about different countries a minute ago as part of the feedback. Some people are really suspicious of CRM systems. They just are, you know, what data has that got about me? Where's it going? Is this just a stick to beat me up with? Position it in a positive light. So what are the pros and what are the cons? And if there is a conversation that needs to be had that says, yes, you know, we will we'll look at your performance at the end of the year. We will look, be, be looking at churning the capability because we need to grow as a business. Be honest about it. You know, it's not going to go away. You can't sugarcoat it if that's the objective that you have. But be clear about that upfront so people have that control and they can then manage their performance against that throughout the year. Don't make it a surprise. Invest in sales manager coaching and increase their time. So by leaning more on the system to do the administrative work, you know, the Excel spreadsheets that Vicky talked about in her previous job, and using the system to do that legwork for you should free you up to spend more time coaching. Now, Gartner says through research they had last year when they were CEB that managers should spend 60% of their time coaching their people to grow new business. The actual amount of time, if managers have seven, um, uh, have nine direct reports, is probably 7%. So we don't spend enough time coaching our people. Um, and I heard the conversation uh, just here. Uh, sometimes we promote our best salespeople and ask them to be managers. Do we really invest in those great people and give, tell them how to manage and how to coach? Um, interestingly, uh, Forbes just did some research and they said out of um, the, the organisations um, that actually outperformed their quotas, 69 of the sales professionals in those teams said their sales leaders and managers were excellent. So there is a correlation between great sales leadership and actually your P&L and I'll come on to uh, some of those stats. Um, as you can see here, this is from uh, Salesforce, um, coaching can generate a 17% performance difference, but those being coached and not coached. So it is 
visible okay so it is worth the investment and I would definitely say if I had to do one thing I would think about the leadership and coaching capability of my line managers because however much you spend on on Salesforce and the license and AI people aren't going to put the right data in and you're not coaching for success to use those tools then you're never really going to see the true investment and all that happens is you're constantly hitting with a stick whereas actually what you want to do is create an environment where people go and self-activate and self-use and, and explore. So the second one is, is uh, we talked about it, someone came up with the idea there, is try to make the CRM system to be a one-stop shop. So if it's only a tool that looks at account plans mm. and forecasts and pipeline, I can feel the emotion just burning in me. Oh, God. So what we did in BT is we made it a one-stop shop. We moved all our enablement on there. We used, moved all our customer presentations on there. We moved everything that we could. So actually, rather than going into the central internet page, all our sales guys went through this. We used the mobile app on our phone, so it was easier to go through Salesforce to get data on SharePoints than it was to faff around trying to click the link on your Outlook email. So actually we created an area where people wanted to go of which forecasting, although exceptionally important for us as a business, was part of. So we weren't creating that kind of gut, mm, update my forecast uh, straight away because we made it kind of a friendlier space. Um, and the other thing I would say is only use the reports on Salesforce. How many people in their organisations have Salesforce or a CRM sales tool and then someone still walks in with their spreadsheet, right? <laughs> Where's your pipeline? Oh, well, let me just tell you about my spreadsheet. This is where I am. I've done it all locally because I, I quite like Excel. No, 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 no. <laughs> if it's not on here, it doesn't count. Likewise, how many times you've been in a board meeting and there's some discussion up here and then someone goes, I'll, I'll take that away. No, 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 no. Start from the conversation of the data in the system and then if the system's not quite right or you think there's another perception, go and investigate. Start with the system. That's what you're paying for. Mm. Be clear about what the KPIs that you want. Make sure you have business outcome measures like revenue and also behavioural measures. Yes, they are a little bit hard to put directly into Salesforce. Vicky said, you know, it's something they're looking at. But there's other suppliers out there that can link them in. Um, uh, uh, I think Mind Boggle, Mind Tickle was a great one that we were thinking about using in terms of putting in our sales training and linking it in so we could link our Salesforce badges all the way through automated. Um, and ensure that when you are doing the flows uh, of information that they're transparent. And I'd ask yourself, how far up and down do you really need to go? If I'm a frontline manager and my CEO can drill down at any point into my sales data, how does that make me feel? I'm feeling like, oh shit. Does that mean I'm going to go in and update it every, every Friday or every day? Maybe, maybe not, but it's going to put me in a threat state. Does the CEO need to see, or actually should that be the accountability and the responsibility of people beneath him? You know, mm. I'd probably argue that it does. He just needs to have a rolled up view of how the company is performing as a whole. As I said, use those value added tools. So uh, if anyone was at Dreamforce uh, this year, you saw the demonstration of being able to talk to your phone and update your contacts, link it in with Microsoft, make it uh, simple. That landscaping tool is, is cracking because it gives you a coaching conversation to have about opportunities, what support do they need? How, is this an opportunity for their customer? And it's a great way to have those conversations to look for those kind of white spots of revenue opportunity. Piece of work I would say that we did is to use the Salesforce chatter as a, a tool uh, to reach out to other functions in, in the organization, right? Because that's really important. Your sales guys are at the front end. They know much more about the customers. They see it in real time but they don't have all the answers and nobody in the organization is going to have all the answers. So you've got this great uh, facility uh, which is Chatter on Salesforce as part of our deal. Everybody had a free license uh, to go on to Chatter, um, whether they were in marketing, sales or HR and our sales guys could post a question and somebody in that to somebody in the community who knew, like the product manager, and because we were global, by the time often they'd woken back up, someone had answered their question. And that was really important because A, it built status because, hey, I'm a subject matter expert and someone needs my help. Then somebody thought I have the answer and that was really quick and simple. And it started them going into the system more often. 
Plus we used it to uh, celebrate deals, right? Big wins because we found that in terms of our enablement, yes, they needed to understand the products we were selling, but actually the calls and the insight calls that people most turned up to was when we had somebody win a big deal, that they went on and they talked about their journey, about how they got the customers engaged, what information did they give them in terms of hidden insights so the customers hooked in, how they got the product team and the marketing team to help them present that, and then how they looked at the finances of that deal with finance. And they were the things that the people, sales guys were more interested in uh, than probably some of the portfolio training that we did and it was that kind of give me something that I don't already know. Interestingly, uh, continuing on the Gartner theme, they looked at the four different ways, well they looked at quite a few people within their um, product group of managers of who was doing really, really well and uh, they came up with kind of four ways of uh, great management. Um, it was around teacher, which is kind of as it says, that you basically pass on your expertise to people for them to go and learn from and you give feedback in people's development. An always on manager that was always there coaching in the moment. You've all heard that coach in the moment, <laughs> corridor coach, right? Uh, and then they had a connector manager, which was the person that maybe not have all the answers, but point people around the organization or to other people or to other mentors that they had. And then the cheerleader manager, which was always, hey, so they done a great job, let's celebrate them on our team call and you're making sure it was all fair and everything. Um, what they found was is that people responded most to the connector manager. So 26% of high performing teams said they performed better when they had a connector manager and actually when they looked at sales as a function that was 47%. Now this works really well because as a manager when we rolled out the kind of rock and other parts as part of the leadership statement, the fear that managers had was does this mean I have to have all the answers? Uh, no, it doesn't. So spending that time on coaching doesn't mean that you get more questions and you have to know everything. By using the connector approach, A, people like it because it gives them autonomy to mm. go and then speak to other people and work their own way through, but also it creates less stress for the managers because they can point people to other subject matter experts, which means it doesn't all sit on their shoulders. So I have never seen as many uh, male colleagues uh, from my engineering departments breathe a sigh of relief when they realized that it wasn't them that had to have all the answers. And, and as they kind of gone up through the management ranks, that's what they thought was important. So to know that's not the case is a great stress reliever for some. Okay, just moving on then. Um, the other thing about using the CRM system is to use it in a positive way uh, around customer insight. So we talked about complex deals, um, and we know about the kind of data age, There's so much information out there. We also know that often when we go and see customers, they probably know as much of our products before we've got to see them. And in fact, you know, Gartner will say that it's kind of 57% of the research about the, the, about the sellers and the products has already been made before you've walked into the door to talk to them about an opportunity. Um, so therefore, what becomes really impactful is sharing across your sales community, how they sold stuff. I said that's what they want to hear. And in BT, we used a company called Corporate Visions that asked us to think about unconsidered mm. needs. So, you know, often this is around um, great relationships and trusted partnerships is about speaking to a supplier because they speak to other customers like you. So it's not the stuff that's written on the internet, but it's the, I've been there, done it, worn the t-shirt, and actually I know how to make this better. So it's reducing the risk. <laughs> and that's why you go to large companies, because actually a lot of it now around big decision making, multiple stakeholders, when you're doing those kind of complex deals, it's about reducing the risk for the customer. So being able to communicate where you've done that before, what lessons you learned, uh, et cetera, is really important as your value added sale. It's also really interesting to share with uh, your customers, you know, not obviously giving names or giving away confidentiality, but they're doing this because they're seeing this in the market. Is that something that you're seeing? That's a great opener. So being able to give that information in real time through your CRM system and creating that community of support is actually a great way to give your sales guys that competitive edge 
and they love it. So the more that you can use Chatter, the more that you can create community groups, and it could be just your portfolio team saying that they've been, I don't know, with a Cisco event or another large supplier event, and they've seen that this is coming up. It's that tip bit of information that gets that conversation going with customers is a great other way to uh, create a reward state on your CRM system. The fifth one I would say is um, keep it simple. Uh, uh, and uh, it's interesting because when Vicky says it's simple to use, it, it really is. And I don't know if your organisations with any like the ones that I've worked in, but sometimes when you give it to the IT department that what was simple that came out of the box by the time it's configured, you're like, what the hell, right? So um, what I would say is keep it simple. Um, and I would also say, Think about how the buyer buys, right? Because if you sit there and you look at your processes, you'll go, right, I need this piece of information here. This needs to go to the deal surgery. This is everything I need, and I need a clear address, and yada, yada, yada. And sometimes customers don't know, right? But you've got a time scale as a salesperson, and you need to get the resources because you know it's a big opportunity. You know that the proposal's coming forward, and how do you do that? So keep it simple and keep it flexible, but always design it with the customer experience and the salesperson's experience at the forefront of your mind. And then you will make sure that you haven't just got to tick buttons, or people will put just junk in just to make sure it clicks over to the next thing because they have to. And if you think about the statement that I said at the first place, it's about accuracy and timeliness of data. Be clear about what needs to be mandated. Be clear about what it is you do need, but don't just get them to fill, fill fields in for the, for the end of it. Clearly, it's something different if you're doing your CPQ, your configure price quote on your CRM system. But if you're just looking at your sales process, I'd be saying, you know, get the agreement and then fill in the CPQ part and fill that in as maybe as you're going, but don't hold one onto the other. As, uh, you know, um, Vicky mentioned, you know, sales is very much about an art. How many times we've had those deal reviews and you said, how do you know you're going to win that? I don't know, it's a gut feel, I know the gut really, really well. <laughs> Rather than a science, uh, you know, when we lose a bid, it was the portfolio. When we win, it's about the relationship. We all know that one, right? So again, by constraining the boxes too much on the system, you're kind of feeling that threat state. You're feeling, I'm just going to put something in to get rid of this. Um, and someone talked about it in terms of question, be really clear what's in it for me. You know what, and if it's not in it for me, and it's what we need to do for us as a business, and it's part of our purpose, be clear about that as well. Don't try and sugarcoat it. Sales people, we're all very bright people, we can smell it a mile away, right? So just be clear, uh, keep it simple, but really, really, really think about, number one, um, think about the coaching part. So just kind of done a bit of a summary here that looks at why these kind of top tips I've suggested help overcome and create a reward state. I think they sound, I'm sure they sound simple. I think we would love to do a lot more coaching. We'd love to do that investment. And I would say to you, if you haven't done it, push hard to get it. Um, and the reason for that is that when we looked at this at BT and we looked at our usage and who was using it the most, uh, interestingly, it wasn't about people who had done more training, it was actually the line manager creating a community in a reward structure. What we saw was um, significantly more opportunities, and in the case study we had, it was 40% more. Um, they sold more products of our portfolio, and that's because they had more people supporting them and they were happy to use the system to reach out, whether they're based in you know, the Netherlands or America. Um, they posted more because they wanted that interaction and they were kind of a bit kind of hooked on the positive recognition of getting a response back. Um, they therefore logged in more uh, and obviously their account plans because they were using that insight from others to look at opportunities was a lot better. Salesforce, uh, I found this on one of their blogs, give you some kind of um, financial, so close rates increased by 70% from what they've seen. Deals de um, expired, deals in the system, so you know everyone's had them. Oh yeah, it's going to close in seven days, and they've been on there for like two years. <laughs> uh, they uh, decreased by 63%. Mm -hmm. Close date changes, because um, that's really important if we think we've got a big deal and we're trying to close it for that quarter because we're reporting upwards. Uh, um, that decreases by 25%. 
a day since last customer touch by sales um, decreased by 73. And that, was, I would say, <coughs> is because they're getting more things to talk about by using that platform to create a community, understanding their customers better and what's happening in the marketplace to go out there and have something meaningful to say. So there's obviously clearly a financial benefit, there's a usage benefit, but I'm sure David will talk to you about the stress management piece, there's a human benefit. So people who are engaged and in a reward state stay longer, feel more positive and are actually probably some of your best sales people because they've only got something to say about positive word of mouth because they're bought into your purpose because they feel great to work for you. So that's it for me, a quick whistle stop about some things around threat and, behave, threat and reward behaviours and neuro-linguistic science around CRM. Hope you found it useful. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you very much. Some great insight there. I'm sure we can all take away a lot from today. Um, just to let you know, the sessions have been recorded. So if you're an ISM member, you will be able to access the, uh, the content through the members area within the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, we're going to break for lunch in a couple, of, uh, a couple of minutes. A couple of things I'd like to point out. I'm sure both Kerry and Vicky will be around over lunch, so feel free to ask any questions. I feel that last session certainly has you know, raised a lot, of, a lot of issues, and I'm assuming we've got a lot to talk about over lunch. We're going to break it till we'll actually finish at 1 o'clock. Before you go, or before you leave after lunch, because I know we're not reconvening, the feedback forms are really important to us. If you could give us your feedback on today and certainly any topics you'd like to see for future events, uh, we will be hosting more events over the year and across the country. The next one is in the northeast, uh, scheduled for March, uh, March the 12th at Durham. Then we'll be in London, uh, Manchester early April, and then another Midlands event in June. So it'd be good to see you out there and interacting with us and, and coming to, to learn more about uh, sales topics that hopefully will be driven by you on, on your forms, uh, some of the stuff you'd like to see. So thanks for everyone today. We're going to break for lunch. Um, safe journeys back, and uh, we hope to see you very soon at the next regional event. Thank you.